Are we live, John? Not yet. Okay, just let me know. There's so much light in here. Let me turn them off. The background on this is terrible looking. All right, you guys. Welcome everyone to the COVID-19 communityresources.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. I will be your moderator for the evening. My name is Tropicana from 101.1 The Wiz. Usually my co-host is here with me, um, the very amazing Vice Mayor Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney, um, who will not be joining us today, but is with us in spirit. Today, we're going to be talking about mental health and what that journey looks like. In the conversation, we're going to be talking to our very, very, very uh, amazing panel. We have uh, two doctors online today that will be sharing their professional view as well as answering questions. So if you have any, you're more than welcome to submit them um, in the Q&A uh, section here at the bottom. Um, I would also like to say a, a very big shout out to our tech team, John and everybody at the Center for Closing the Health Gap. Thank you for all that you do to make these things possible. But with no further ado, I'd like to begin to introduce some of our panel and start with some opening words. First, we have Dr. Rich Hall. Dr. Rich Hall is a licensed clinical psychologist. How are you doing, Dr. Hall? I'm doing great, doing great. Glad to be here. Would you like to share a little bit about yourself and why you feel like this conversation on mental health is so important? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I am a clinical psychologist who's been operating independently um, in a practice in Cincinnati, as well as in Oxford. I'm in my Oxford office today, uh, Ohio, where I work with a variety of people. I'm what we call a generalist. So I work with people struggling with anxiety, depression. Um, one of my passions is to work with men and help them un better understand themselves as emotional creatures, uh, better understand how to navigate their emotions, and that emotions won't necessarily be a thing that have to get out of control, uh, and that anger is often a, a cover for other emotions. So that's a lot of the work I do. Um, and I feel like you asked another question, but I might have forgotten it. I'd like to, I'd like you to uh, just share a few words on why you feel like this conversation is so important to our community. Um, I think it's important because, you know, that's one of the things where we have a lot of resilience in um, the community, uh, particularly the African American. We learned a lot about what it takes to sort of get through a lot of things, a lot of traumas. But I think one of the things we haven't always learned is healthy ways to cope. Uh, we, we've got some stuff that goes well for us. But when it comes to our emotional intelligence, while we've been able to navigate this this world, this life, we haven't always had um, good information uh, and and good ways to to deal with some of the stuff that as a community we've had to overcome. So I think one of my main missions is to provide sort of an education around how do we be healthier uh, as a community uh, and healthier as individuals. Well, thank you, Dr. Hall. It looks like we're going to have a very interesting conversation and we're going to learn a lot. Also, we have on our panel one of my favorite ladies in the city, Dr. Kalisha Brooks. She is a holistic practitioner as well as a psychologist. Hi, Dr. Brooks. How are you doing this evening? Hello, beautiful people. I hope I don't have too much light going on, but I'm excited to be here to have this amazing conversation, anything related to mental and emotional wellness. Um, a little bit about myself. I am also a psychologist and a holistic practitioner. And what that is, is I look at the whole person, mind, body, spirit, and soul, and incorporate that into the work that I do. Uh, currently, I am the mental health lead for the George Floyd Foundation. I am the social impact advisor for MTV. And I am working with um, Harvard Business School, working with their minority students, helping them to create social impact programming. And so I consider myself to be a mental health activist um, and just fighting the cause, fighting the good fight. But Thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Um, before we move on with the rest of our panel, can you just speak to why this conversation in particular is important to you for our community? Um, it's needed. I don't think we have, um, similar to what Dr. Hall said, enough quality, impactful information out there that's really, really helping the community. I hope we can dive into a little bit of that. I think there's a lot of talk, but not enough action. Um, in actually impactful action. So that's problematic. So I think that it's a very important conversation. 
Thank you. Moving forward with our panel, we also have media personality and DJ, DJ Jado from 101.1 The Wiz. Good evening, Jado. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. You want to share a little bit about yourself and why this conversation on mental health is <clears throat> special and uh, important to you as well? Um, I think it's special and important to me because I feel like just as a Black man in America, we all suffer some type of trauma, whether it is from the neighborhoods we grow up, the things we experience. And a lot of us don't uh, don't really know ways to identify it, to better explain some of our actions. So I think this is a good topic, just mental health now, especially nowadays, is just important that people should know how to handle it, how to uh, get help if they need to. So I feel like it's a, a good reason for me to be a part of it. Thank you for sharing. Also on the panel today, we have our guest, Ms. Kenya Lewis, who is an RN here in Cincinnati. She is also a health service administrator here. Hi, Kenya, how are you this, how are you this evening? I'm wonderful, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Do you wanna give us a little bit about your background professionally and then share with us why your journey in mental health is important to you? So I have been a nurse for years upon years. Don't, don't wanna give away my age now. Um, and I have been at the Hamilton County Justice Center for nine years. I mean, obviously, uh, working in corrections, you see a lot of mental health, um, and especially a, um, amongst the Black community. Um, and it, it's so important. It is so important. There is lack of resources, and a lot of drugs and mental health are a reason why a lot of our community, um, why they're incarcerated. So it is so important because... Um, the recidivism rate is so high in corrections. And if I can be of any impact, I would, I would love to, you know, um, help my community. So mental health is, is so important. Absolutely. Thank you, Kenya. Now, when we have these conversations, I want you to know that your voice, your questions, your thoughts are all very valued. So if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A section and we'll make sure that our experts on the panel address them. Um, as we are starting off the conversation, I really want to kind of hone in on the point that for the last few years, we have been talking on social media and on the radio and in the media about putting your mental health first. But a lot of us have not been privy to what that actually means. We say it, you gotta put your mental health first. You gotta take care of you first. You need to learn how to relax. You need to understand your emotional intelligence. And most people, if we're really genuinely honest, don't know what no emotional intelligence is. We don't know how to put our mental health first. Most people have a lot of responsibility and you don't have time to think about that. So I'd like to kind of start the conversation with Dr. Hall. Can when let's just get to the basics of mental health therapy and understanding what emotional uh, intelligence is. When you use that term, what are you referring to when you say emotional intelligence? So very often when we're discussing emotional intelligence, we're talking about a person's ability to be aware of, control, and express their emotions and to handle the emotions of others. So how well do they understand um, and interface with other people when it comes to their emotions. So how do you keep your emotions in check, understand them, recognize them, but also how do you understand what those emotions, what the reactions to those emotions could be, what emotions people are giving back to you? Um, and can you do that gracefully? Are you uh, good at those under those understandings? Are you prone to misunderstandings? And that if you can have that, rel that level of self-awareness, then maybe you can reduce a lot of the problems that we see sort of happening to people when they miscommunicate emotionally. Doc, Dr. Hall, um, Jado spoke to the fact that a lot of Black men kind of struggle with mental health. Jado, if you'd like to chime in on this, you said that some of the things that you experienced from your neighborhoods or some of the trauma that Black men have just inherited over generations, how do we begin to show them how to uh, uh, begin to work on their mental health? Or what are the first steps that they should be looking at and taking to see if they need to be talking to a therapist? Jado and Dr. Hall, either of you guys are able to, to speak to that. Oh, uh, Dr. Hall, you can go ahead first. Oh, sure, sure. Um, so a lot of times it's, do they find themselves in patterns or cycles <laughs> where their behaviors, their emotions, their mood is upsetting their ability to function? Uh, that's that's where we sort of start to define whether or not something is worthy of getting 
or not necessarily worthy, but like, should you be seeking additional help and resources? It's, are you disrupted in school per se, if you're a young student or at your work? Are you unable to attend work? Are you attending work, but you're having a lot of problems at work? Are your relationships being affected by the problems that seem to be happening over and over and over again? And if that is the case, then um, seeking out support, talking to someone in your life, in your community that can help you to manage these issues. Um, and more often than not, people know when they're struggling uh, and they know that they might need more help. But a lot of times in our community, we have a lot of stigma around seeking outside help and support. Uh, it's, 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 you know, the age old, you just don't tell family business. So when there's stuff going on, we might avoid connection, connecting with uh, help because you just don't trust certain authorities. You don't trust that people are going to understand your issues. And so it makes it difficult to feel okay. Uh, and I want to point to one of the things Kenya just said. We know statistically that one of the main providers of substance abuse treatment and mental health support is our judicial system. That's that's the kind of the system we've just left to handle the issues that we know are very rampant, very prevalent. Uh, in our community, uh, because they're just not paying to have the to get the help uh, out here in the world. But when they go through those systems, it's like they kind of have to uh, provide them with some, and it's often not nearly as much as we know people need. They don't. I'm I'm sure that you have tons of friends, and being the popular radio personality that you are, I'm sure that you and your very illustrious group of male friends are talking about your mental health on a daily basis. What are some of the reasons why your why your, I would say, not maybe your community, that your friends may shy away from therapy. What are some of those challenges? Um, repeat the question one more time. What are some of the challenges that you see amongst the Black men that you know on why they um, won't pursue therapy? Um, I think a lot of it is a lot of people, a lot of them don't have insurance. So a lot of them find it hard to really pay out of pocket for it because therapy is is expensive. Well, I won't say it's expensive, but it costs. A lot of a lot of people don't have the funds to do it. Uh, a lot of people are. Some people, a lot of people, just feel like I don't need that. Like I'm quite sure we we have all ran into somebody who's just overly aggressive or super emotional and you might you might come across them and be like you might need to talk to somebody and they're like no I'm good I'm good I'm all right I'm all right no you might need to talk to somebody and I just think it's a pride thing with a lot of men too like a lot of a lot of men feel like just the pride in them they just have to suck it up and go on about their day and not really necessarily understanding that you might you might need to talk to somebody so have you uh have you taken have you taken steps to pursue therapy? Yes, I did. I um I went to I've been to therapy twice. I've been to uh relationship therapy and I've also been to therapy on my own. So um both experiences were were rather different um for, just for me uh specifically. Uh, I think when I was in relationship therapy, it was a lot because it was, I just, me, me personally, I felt like, I felt like I was in school. Yeah. So the therapist like gave us homework. And at the time I'm just like, I ain't trying to do all of that. Like, I'm just trying to talk and figure it out. I'm not trying to go home and do all this work and write down stuff. And I was just so against it. But after months of not going to it and actually sitting back and and analyzing what was going on i understood what what she was doing and when i went to uh therapy on my own i had a very i said i had a really good therapist i just felt like after going that i didn't have any real bad mental issues that made me want to continue to go to therapy like i'm i'm not one of those type of people who have been traumatized as a kid or had a real bad upbringing and been abused or really go through things throughout my day that stresses me out or anything like that so i stopped going um and that was the reason why i stopped going because i just got to a point where like do i really need to go to therapy like 
of course we all go through things through our everyday life where yeah you need to you might need to talk to somebody but as far as going like every week i felt like it wasn't it wasn't working or it wasn't helping or hurting me wow so now one thing you mentioned is that your therapist gave you homework was that and that was your first therapy experience <laughs> Now, yeah, that was I want my to first. turn this over to the experts. For those who are watching this, or for those of our, our viewers and our community that are listening into this conversation, if you've never had an experience with therapy, you absolutely have no idea what you are getting yourself into other than I'm going to get some help. And we have this idea of what it is. I just knew I was going to go somewhere. I was going to lay down on a couch and they were going to ask me um, questions and take notes. And I did, had no expectation of having to do homework either, Jado. And when I got there she said you got some homework I was like I don't know if I'm coming back Dr. Holmes, Dr. Brooks, <laughs> I got enough on my plate you want me to do some homework too and not crazy in here can you guys speak to what uh you should be expecting from your first therapy session and what you should if you're experienced we'll come back to that what should you be expecting in your first therapy experience if you've never been to therapy Dr. Hall um and Dr. Brooks whoever would like to take the question first Oh, I can start. Um, I I personally have a different approach, but I'll talk first about tr the traditional approach to therapy. Initially, you have an intake, right? The therapist will collect your history, your um, past experiences, your family dynamics, any uh, previous mental health history, and identify any goals that you currently have. And then you go through the process of the therapist may, you know, describe confidentiality stating that anything we talk about or discuss will stay here. So helping people to kind of feel safe and secure in the relationship. And of course, there's a couple of things with confidentiality. We have to report if a person is a harm to themselves or someone else. So that's very important to know. Um, after that, the therapist will, with the goals that you presented to them, come up with a treatment plan. Um, and they can use different types of you know theoretical orientations of how they want to approach um, the challenges that you come in with that's the traditional way um i am non-traditional i have divorced the traditional systems of therapy i feel that it doesn't always work for us in our community uh jado i'm so glad you mentioned homework because uh some people have experienced that and they they're already overwhelmed, they don't need to feel more overwhelmed. And when a therapist doesn't go into detail about why and what you can expect, a person may not even have liked school. So you're giving me papers and you're giving me assignments. Sometimes people will automatically shut down. Um, that was me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> important to, you know, right off the back, especially for those in our community, knowing that there's already some challenges and barriers, be able to connect deeply with your person, right? And I don't call the people that I work with my clients or my patients. And, and again, this is me. I call them my people. You're my person. You know, I am your person in, in this moment. And I also let them know that I am not the expert of you. You are the expert of you. My position is to hold up a mirror of truth and reflect that. So I'm just going to be a mirror for you and I'm going to help you walk this walk and talk this talk and whatever we need to do, we're going to do it, but you're going to help me help you. So given those that I work with their power, helping them to become empowered and gain their sense of autonomy. Um, and so I think it's very important that as, as professionals, we, especially those that's working in the black community with black people, especially black men, know what to do when you get there when they get there, because it's already hard enough. They, they're they in your possession, they're in your office, in your seat. We applaud that, don't scare them away, <laughs> you know? So um, get a, a vision and idea for what they, they need, listen to them. Don't automatically go in assuming that you know what they need. Um, this is when we talk about cultural competency. A lot of individuals, we have to go beyond cultural competency. You have to know how to connect with the community, how to connect with people, right? And so they'll teach you stuff in a book, and in a classroom saying this is cultural competency, but you're not going to learn about a culture until you immerse yourself in the culture, until you, you know, connect with the culture. And that doesn't mean you have to go in the corner if they like, oh, sell drugs and go to the, you know, the prison system. You're not, you're not asking a doctor <laughs> to say, hey, I need open heart surgery before I can understand it and learn it. No, we're not saying that, but you should at least be familiar with the culture, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my little tidbit. Dr. Hall, we want to speak in on this, you want to chime in on this topic? In regards to your first uh, experiences with therapy, what you should be expecting? I 
could be freeze. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I had to find my mute again. Um, so yeah, the first time, uh, and I, I do appreciate everything Dr. Brooks was saying because, you know, traditionally a lot of us are taught worksheets and I do understand where that comes from because we want to have a shared language and understanding, but it can feel too much like schoolwork. Uh, and so I don't use worksheets. Um, a lot of times that very first meeting, she broke it down very well. We're discussing confidentiality, we're getting a lot of the clinical information we need. So that first time just feels like, and I tell people up front, this is me asking a lot of questions just to get to know you and understand you so that we can develop our goals and strategies on how I can help you get better. Um, and then from there, the next few conversations are genuinely just going to be how you been, how you doing, what's going on with you. Um, and I've learned a lot in my work with men that I try very much to just sort of get them comfortable. You can talk to me about anything. So I'm trying to just build rapport in the early stages, uh, because I just think it's important that a person feel comfortable in a conversation with someone about stuff they might've never discussed with anyone before. Uh, and if they don't feel, if they feel like I'm just a guy in a suit, then, um, they're not going to want to, you know, tell me about their deep, dark stuff. Uh, and very often I have to kind of say, people ask, can I talk to you about this? Absolutely. I'm here to talk about anything and I'm never telling anyone what we talk about. Uh, so, um, it can feel very stuffy. It can feel very weird. Uh, it, it's a weird experience to sit down with a person you've never met before and tell them the stuff that's been in your mind, maybe for years or, or, uh, for a while that, you know, is bothering you. But one of the things that I try to do, and, and I, I hope most therapists try to do is make the situation comfortable so that you feel like you can share openly what's going on with you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you. You know, um, Kenya, we had a conversation offline about knowing how to find a, a therapist that is a good fit for you. So Dr. Brooks, Dr. Hall, um, just kind of leading us to you guys one more time. If I am experienced, I'm in a therapy session and I have a therapist and I'm not really feeling comfortable. When do, when should I know I should move away and go look at another therapist or um, maybe, how do we know we're not putting in enough work? Maybe me and Jado should have done those worksheets. Maybe it's us that are impeding our progress in therapy. How do we know that the therapist that we are looking for is a good fit for us? Dr. Hall, can you chime in on that first? It is very much about the vibe. So if you're in the room and you're not feeling connected, like this is, it is in many ways, I tell people when they're choosing a therapist, it is a little like choosing a friend. Now they're not a friend, but you do need to feel comfortable and able to open up to them in a way. And if you don't, if you're in there for a couple of weeks and it's still not quite feeling right, then maybe that's not the right therapist for you. Uh, and maybe you go look for someone that you do kind of feel a better energy with. Uh, and so- um, and, and, and I have to tell people that so that they don't get fully turned off the idea of therapy. Like, well, it didn't work with this one person, so I'm never doing therapy again. No, give it a try with another person. I know it's going to be weird. I know it's going to be awkward, but try to find someone you feel a good vibe with, because if you don't, it's going to be hard to show up every week and tell that person your stuff if it just doesn't feel right. Absolutely. Dr. Brooks, now Jado mentioned that therapy can become expensive and I need to find a therapist that's a good fit for me. Do you have tips for some of our viewers or participants on how or how to make sure that we are managing that the best for us when we are looking for a therapist? Yes. Well, first and foremost, if the person has insurance and we know that that's a barrier, as Jado mentioned, um, a lot of individuals don't have insurance, but if the person does have insurance, making sure that they find someone in network, right? And um, finding different bios on psychologists and therapists um, that have, you know, what they're looking for in the description. So if you're struggling with anxiety, find out, you know, find somebody that may specialize in generalized anxiety disorders, or if it's depression, or if it's eating disorders, or if it's trauma, you know, find someone that may have a specialization in that area. Now, I am biased, um, meaning that the systems are broke. <laughs> They're broke. <laughs> they are broken. And it's hard sometimes to have these type of conversations, especially in the community. And you mentioned it in the beginning, Trop, about we're on social media, we're on platforms, we're on panels saying, go get therapy, go seek therapy, go do this, go do that. And I feel like sometimes it's a form of gaslighting 
mental and emotional gaslighting because you bring to light all the issues that a person has and say, hey, go do this thing, go seek out. And when you get there, the resources, the people, the capacity is not there. And now you're leaving a person feeling hopeless and helpless. That is a problem, especially in our community because we constantly do it. Black people go get therapy. Black people go get healing. Black men, you need help. Black women, you got problems. We constantly do this, but the system does not have the capacity, nor the competency, nor the ability to meet these needs. And so, and I get this constantly, my heart just aches for the community because I'm like, you out there and they see you, especially a black person, like, and it's like gold. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, how, how do we do this? How do we do that? That's why I have shifted my focus to community mental health, building and creating programs and initiatives where I'm teaching people how to be self healers, healing, going back to our ancestral roots of saying, hey, how do we get together as a community? How do we now maybe train some of these barbers and beauticians and big mamas and community centers on how to build capacity and hold space for people? Because if we're honest, a lot of people cannot afford therapy. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're seeing people who um, are more privileged being able to go to these healing retreats, right? And these seminars and meet with these gurus and say, oh, if, if therapy, if you can, you know, get your needs meet, met in therapy, go to this retreat, the six week retreat that's called, that costs $10,000 with this guru who's an excellent healer. And so people are just here, they're sitting here left with what? Podcasters, mm -hmm. there's right? telling you a, a, a post telling you what you need to do for your mental and emotional wellness. And I'm not knocking that, but sometimes it's so much deeper, especially that mind body connection. It's not just you're having thoughts, feelings, and emotions. It can also be a chemical hmm. and it could be a chemical connection. So being able to provide education for our people and saying, okay, how do we start using food as medicine? How do we now, you know, look at how we sleep and eating and exercise? And I love to tell people, like, make sure you got your priorities in order. First, check your sleep, your eating, your, your ability to move your body. That is like medicine to the spirit. And so, you know, some people, some mental health issues can be cured if you just went to sleep, <laughs> you know, um, some, not all, but, you know, it's, it's a real issue. So I know I went down my rabbit hole. That is my tangent, but I, I just had to address the capacity issue it's not right. there yeah, because that's very true we are self-diagnosing ourselves we are kind of left to what we can afford which is sometimes those social media experts and influencers who are not influencers or experts at all so I'm glad that you touched on that because it is a hard balance between knowing who the experts are in real life when we do not have access to that information now um Kenya you have had your own personal experience with therapy can you share a little bit of that in your journey with us Yes. Um, so when I first, when I first went to therapy, I went when I was raising a teenage daughter and we were battling, you know, I was like, I wanted to parent different than how I was raised. And so it was, I mean, <laughs> raising a teenage girl is, is not easy. So I knew, I knew that we needed outside help. Um, and that was my first experience with therapy. Um, I would say it was, it was pretty successful, you know, um, it was, it was a pretty successful experience. And then as an adult, I recently, um, went to, I, I tried therapy out and the reason why I went this time was just life, you know, um, the, 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 I had a difficulty with my work life balance being, you know, when, and I'm an entrepreneur, so it's like, I go to work, I go to my business and you feel like you're lacking as a parent, you know? And I'm like, I, I never felt like I was doing enough. So it was this feeling of guilt. It was this feeling of like being overwhelmed with just life. And uh, the last therapist I went to, it was not a good fit. And I knew that, pr I knew that pretty early on. And I knew that after our first session, I knew I wouldn't be back. And I thought that, um, I thought that it would be a good fit automatically because he was black. You know, I'm like, oh, he's black and, you know, he'll understand me. It, it was, it, that was not the case. So I definitely, um, you know, I did when I did go to that person because they did take my insurance. You know, I reached out to another therapist and they didn't. Um, so I ended up, this was like a, another option. And I went to this particular therapist and it was, it was not a good fit. 
it was not a good fit. Um, so I when you said it wasn't a good fit. Can you kind of expound on some of those red flags that it, that you saw that let you know that you needed to look elsewhere? It was he was overly religious. Everything went back to the Bible, and and I don't need I don't need the Bible stuffed down my throat. I'm I'm religious, you know. I believe in God, and everything was just went right back to the Bible, and it was just it, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. It wasn't, it felt very preachy. He was preaching to me instead of, um, I think most of the, in, in that my particular therapy session, he spoke more than I did. And I was just sitting there like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, I agree, you know, I believe in God, you know? So it was, um, that was, that was a little, I was turned off from that experience. Um, but that's on, Dr. Brooks, I see you guys kind of over there cringing. You want to jump in on this conversation? Both of them, like, oh, <laughs> Dr. Hall, your your cringe was a little bigger, so you started. <laughs> you you were on mute. You hate to see it. You hate to see it. Um, you hear a lot of these criticisms of clinicians, particularly in our community. Uh, a lot of clinicians are Christian counselors. They have a strong religious background and everybody ain't coming for that. And so um, people can get very turned off because it's bringing up other traumas. It's bringing up, you know, um, their own uh, maybe complicated relationship with religion. Maybe they've, uh, you know, they don't connect with religion at all. And so if you're coming in with that particular bent, um, you're not going to bring people over to your side. You're not going to get people to feel comfortable in the space. Uh, and so um, and you know, she just described like a therapist who's talking more than you are, then how, how are you learning who they are? How are you going to help them with their particular issues? Once again, the person should feel comfortable sharing who they are. And as a therapist, I'm supposed to understand as much as I can of their point of view to help them get to where they want to go. I can't prescribe to you. We all know the prescription for a happy, healthy life. So I, I'm not even really telling you stuff. You might not already know what I'm supposed to be doing is hearing you describe your journey as the expert on you and then helping you maybe stitch together some perspectives and thoughts and ideas you haven't quite thought of yet. But if I'm spending all that time just prescribing to you what, what's going to make you a better person, then yeah, you're going to get turned off. You're not going to want to talk to me. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Dr. Brooks. Yeah, that mute button, it hides. It's like, wait a minute. It? It, <laughs> it disappeared, don't it? <laughs> So, um, oh yeah, similar to what Dr. Haw said, it is, it's just disheartening when you do hear, hear individuals have an experience like that, because that's unfortunately what you see in the Black communities when you do find a Black therapist. We are um, Black Jesus all day, every day, pray Love about it. <laughs> tell you what John said in the third you know and I get that I'm a woman of faith I love Jesus I love God I am a woman of faith however God also says use wisdom you know and with wisdom you allow the person to tell you what to bring into the room if they want to talk about religion and they want to talk, excellent you can bring that and you open up that door but if they don't open up that door that is not your responsibility to to bring Jesus to them this is not that type of moment right now Right. And so the, you know, therapists being able to really use wisdom, knowledge and understanding as it relates to people. And to me, that's a human thing. Just learn to connect with people. Listen to what they may need in this moment. You know, you can. It's interesting because, you know, if a person breaks their arm and they're in church, are you just going to sit there and pray that the arm is healed? Yes, they do. But you also taking them to the doctor. Now, is the doctor going to sit there and just pray and we just going to pray and believe that your arm? Yes. But I also have this level of expertise where I know how to fix your, fix your broken arm. And that's what they miss. They don't bring in, okay, I'm not coming here for you to teach me about God. I got God. I want to, to understand what he gave you to help me. Maybe, you know, that. That's what I'm needing to know. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge as we talk about mental and emotional wellness in our community. It is, it's so layered. It's so layered and I want us to continue to have these type of conversations to come to some real impactful solutions because we can't just keep talking yeah. about it. And 
much like you said, our community, we do love God and we do love Jesus. And he has been our fix all end all to every problem. It's been passed down from generation to generation. So uh, moving past that and also including therapy, if we're in therapy and that is the experience that we have, uh, how do we how do you communicate that to your therapist or do you communicate that to your therapist or you just go find another one? What is your suggestion for that when we have that experience? Uh, myself or Dr. Yes. Hall? Oh. Uh, I would say I see your therapeutic relationship and Dr. Hall made mention of it as well, almost like a romantic relationship. If I don't feel safe and comfortable enough to speak my truth, this is not it. Right. And if you feel like you're biting your tongue or you're not um, showing up as your full, whole, authentic self, that's not that's not the relationship. Right. And oftentimes, you know, doctors in this position and other therapists, we already hold a certain level or a certain position of what they call power. Because, again, you're coming in believing that this person is the expert. So that's why I always tell my people. I am not the expert of you. I want you to be totally authentic, completely free in what you have to talk about and express. I'm a human being just like you. I may have some, some wisdom, knowledge, and some, some systems and tools to, to give to you, but there may be things you're also able to teach me. So I'm going to be a, a learner of you. You know, I'm going to be a listener of you. And together we're co-conspirators of this, co-creators, you know, we're going to figure this thing out. And so I would tell a person that if they don't feel like it's a good fit to be assertive. And if you don't feel like you can be assertive in that moment, just after that session, you don't have to come back. You know, you don't have to tell them anything, just, okay, we're going to wrap it up. But if you feel like you want to say, hey, um, I don't like what was said right now, or this is not what I'm asking for as it relates to, you know, you preaching to me and you, we can use different words, but just being open and honest. And in that therapeutic relationship, the therapist should not take offense. Mm -hmm. it, be okay with getting fired if you need to get fired, you know, and you help them <laughs> find a better fit. <laughs> you want to chime in, Dr. Hall, on that? He is nodding his head I mean, like he yeah. I, I think she said it excellently. It is a relationship. If it's not working, you got to go to the next. We we those of us who've been doing this for any amount of time know we cannot be the best fit for every people. Like right, like if we we just don't fit every client um, or people. So uh, we have to be okay with that. So you're not hurting my ego to say I'm sorry. This ain't a good fit. Or a lot of people just ghost. Um, they just don't come back and you just sort of there's there's enough people that have the need that you just move on to the next one uh, and it doesn't really hurt our feelings so, you know, we, I mean sometimes we get attached it, it we feel a way we're human beings but we also recognize the job is the job and hopefully people find their way to somebody that works better for them absolutely just want you to know this is a safe place so if your feelings are hurt Dr. Hall you can communicate that here with us it's a safe space here. <laughs> now we've kind of talked about what your expectations to be when it comes to therapy. I'd like to kind of kind of switch veins. Dr. Brooks, can you tell us for those who may not be able to afford therapy, but they're still feeling overwhelmed? I still am a single parent. I have to get my kid up in the morning, get him to school, get to work, fight with my boss, come home, get my kid ready for dinner in bed, go back to work for my second job. I don't have time to sit down and have therapy. I don't have time to do those routines, but my mental health is important to me and I'm overwhelmed. What are just some things that I could be doing for myself personally to help with my day-to-day -day mental health? Yes, absolutely. So I am an avid believer in uh, meditation, mindfulness, prayer, just taking deep breaths. A breath can do wonders for just your clarity right? And your peace of mind. So first, just learning how to take a moment to just breathe and relax the body. Because oftentimes our body is in fight or flight. Our, you know, nervous system is overwhelmed and just learning how to calm that can bring so much just peace in that moment and clarity for you to know what the next step is needed for you. So one, um, mindfulness meditation or prayer. Um, second, you know, my bandwagon is making sure that you are taking care of your physical health as well. And I call it my C, S-E-E. -E. How are you sleeping, eating, and exercising? That is medicine. Making sure that your body has the bare necessities for what it needs just to, to function. Also, centering joy and gratitude, right? 
if you can learn, and I have been encouraging people, be delusional with your joy. Be delusional with your sense of peace right now because guess what? It's a lot. This world is very, very noisy. There's a lot of normalized dysfunction. And if I'm going to be any, um, what is it? If I'm going to be called toxic, I want to be positively toxic. They talk about you know, toxic positivity, give me that title. I'm okay with having it. <laughs> I'd rather be that than the opposite because, you know, a lot of research is showing that when you can get in a certain emotion, it releases a certain hormone and chemical, chemical in your body that helps to heal the body, right? So we talk about the, the dopamine and the serotonin that's often needed for the body to normalize things, the pleasure hormones. But when we're in stress and negativity and pessimism, we're releasing more of the cortisol and the adrenaline, you know, and that's where a lot of the anxiety and depression can come from. And that's where people started to start to feel overwhelmed and having panic attacks and also creates a lot of disease in the body. So some very simple things that we can start to, you know, incorporate in our day-to-day -day lives, I think can really make a, a difference in taking deep breaths, meditating, making sure your body is getting what it needs, enough sleep, enough movement, enough good, healthy, leafy, green food, you know, and also finding things that bring you joy and center those things and getting delusional about it. Well, those are Bits. Get delusional about your joy. Dr. Hall, you want to chime in as well for our brothers that are listening and carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders and don't have the time to come to therapy. What are some tips that they can be taking? They need to get to therapy. I'm going to come pick them up and drop them off to you. But until then, what can they do? I think I, think I, I want to definitely shout out uh, what Dr. Brooks was just talking about. We are often so, we don't recognize how much our misery is a delusion. It is us sort of focusing on the negatives in our life and not choosing joy. And so the, the more we can recognize, I'm caught, I'm caught up in these patterns of always noticing all the negatives and struggling to notice the positives, which exist. There, there are, there's a silver lining to every cloud. There's something in your life you do have some level of control over, even if it's just your emotional uh, understanding of yourself. And that if you can get better at that, then you might not feel as mired in the negativity as you are. So um, definitely delusional in your joy. I'm going to steal that. I'm sorry. Uh, and um, I would say if I could give people any advice, it's get off your phone. Um, you might be using that device right now to watch this. But after this is done, uh, cut your social media diet. People tell me all the time how much time they don't have. And I'm guilty of this myself. Um, when I cut my phone off and just read a book, I feel better than I do if I'm scrolling Instagram for two, an hour, two hours or TikTok or whatever. We are so caught up in these comparisons, these what we call downward social comparisons, looking at the lives of others and seeing how we don't measure up. Uh, and we know from research that media poisons us. Um, you know, they've done studies on when they just send, okay, you know, them. American television shows to other cities and states, people start to become mentally ill. They start to struggle with their sense of self. Countries that have always been relatively healthy suddenly start developing anorexia or um, you know, depression just by virtue of our media. So it poisons you. And so if you can start anywhere, start by limiting this thing that you know kind of makes you feel all right. It's I, I call it the fast food of human interaction. It makes you feel all right, but you know it's not good for you. So a good first step, if you're already feeling down, feeling sad, feeling anxious, is cut back on this thing that's probably contributing heavy, heavily to it. And then use it more as a tool to find your way to the help, to find your way to the voices that are giving you good information, helpful information, uh, and or to resources that are going to get you the help you need. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Jada, you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I do. Um, it's for Dr. Hall and Dr. Brooks. Um, I, I know being a, a therapist can be stressful, very, very stressful. We hear a uh, uh, a lot of people's deepest, darkest secrets, a lot of people's traumas. But do you feel like the job causes you to have to go to therapy yourself? That's a good question. I love that question. I love that question. I tell people my therapist has a therapist. I think we all, <laughs> all, all need therapy. And I don't see it as just when you have an issue. I see it as like, a, um, I call it vitamins. You know, I'd rather take my vitamins than a medication. And a lot of times we can either go to therapy to, you know, as a proactive tool or as a reactive tool. 
know? And so if we can kind of like keep the oil changed in our car, keep the tires right, keep the, we don't have to worry about breaking down, right? Um, so I think that it's very, very important. And, you know, I, uh, when it comes to the work in and of itself, in all honesty, I absolutely love what I do because I have a love for people. So, and people are like, seriously, like it doesn't always feel like work for me. You know, mm. I think it's your thing. It's your thing when you're graced to do it, when you're gifted to do it, it doesn't feel like work. Now, when it does, when, when it start, when I start to feel a little overwhelmed, I'm not in the right place. I'm not in alignment. So I'm like, um, there's something I need to change, something I need to do. I'm empty. I need to get filled back up. Like I told you, I'm the queen of no. The majority of my work now is for you to work. <laughs> I will shut something down in a minute. Like, uh, there's no price you can put on my piece. So <laughs> I respectfully decline that. Uh, but when I'm in alignment, when I, when I know that it's something I, I should be doing in that moment, it fuels me. It feels like it fills me up. But when I start to feel empty, I'm like, uh, something's not right. I need to make some adjustments and shift. And I think that that's a human thing. You know, like I said, when I work with my people, I'm very transparent. I'm very open about modeling what I preach and teach. Right. I think it's important to say, hey, I have moments, too, when I get down and I know that I may be struggling with some anxiety here or fear here. So I'm not just telling you something that I've read in a book or, you know, I've learned in a classroom. This is what I'm doing with myself and also my community. So, Oh, that's good. She got the quotables. I'm, I'm going to make three t-shirts. <laughs> Illusional <laughs> about my joy. Uh, the queen of no. <laughs> now, last one, hold on. I'm I'm coming back for it, Kenyon. Um, before we come to you, I know you have a question, Dr. Hall. Did you want to chime in or add anything additional to how you decompress or how you handle the weight that you may carry when you are talking to your clients? Yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna agree with what she said and and toss out another thing that I often tell my clients is that a, a well-oiled machine doesn't grind down, right? So if you are doing the things that you know you need to do as far as self-care then yeah, you're going to make it a lot further than if you know you are not taking care of your body in a spiritual, mental, and um, physical way. So you to be healthy, you need to take care of all those domains. Uh, and I myself have been in therapy uh, at different times. You know, one of the things that they require us to do is to seek supervision. So when we know we're hitting our limits and what we understand and what we know, we got to go talk to another therapist, whether they're our therapist or just a person we can trust to deal with an issue there's a part of us that has to sort of believe in this thing we do enough to consult with people who do this for a living. So it's supposed to be baked in. I can't say every therapist out there is doing it, but um, I believe you shouldn't necessarily trust a therapist who doesn't believe therapy works enough to go get it the help when they need it. And the thing about a mental health issue is anyone on this planet can experience a mental health issue at any time. Mental health is a spectrum. Something can happen to you, be it grief, be it loss, be it whatever, that can put you in a space where you need more help and support. Uh, and so I believe uh, very strongly that people should seek that help. Uh, and I believe for me, it's just one of the things I need to do to sort of stay on track. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Kenya, you wanted to chime in, you have a question? Yes, um, just, you know, just being um, not only my work environment, but also my social environment, I see a lot of um, self-medicating. And what I mean by self-medicating is um, overindulgence in alcohol, overindulgence in, you know, weed smoking. And, you know, and, you know, when I talk to, you know, my friends and things of that sort, I'm like, there's something deeper here. Like, you're not, you know, like, why do you smoke every day, all day long? You know, like there, there's something, oh, I just like smoking. No, you don't. You don't just like smoking. There's something deeper there that you really need to tap into. Um, and, you know, on a work level, you know, I, I deal with a lot of, um, a lot of drug abuse and then there are providers that then add medication on top of these people that are already struggling with substance abuse. And now you're adding more more drugs into the regimen, you know? So pr providers, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Dr. Hall or Dr. Brooks? Yeah, I love, I love, uh, I love that Kenya. I love that you brought that to the surface about um, addiction and mental health um, because people are self-medicating. You know, they, they want and need to feel better, similar to when a person goes and see a psychiatrist and they prescribe them, 
you know, a depressant, if they are experiencing, you know, anxiety or, you know, if, if they had, if they are given Adderall, the same thing. You see people popping pills and drinking. I don't even know what people are doing nowadays. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> my, my family used to keep me in the loop. I'm like, I don't know. All I know is don't touch fentanyl. That's all I know right now. <laughs> you know, so um, they are doing everything. <laughs> And I have a nine-year-old. So I'm like, I can't just put my head in the sand. I need to know what's out yeah. there so I can teach and help, you know, navigate. Yeah. But one thing I will say is that um, addiction or, you know, substance use is a symptom, as you mentioned, of something greater and deeper, you know? And a lot of times we want to attack the fruit and never get to the root. And that's what you, when you have these providers, that's just, okay, this person has this substance abuse issue and you're providing even more medication without actually identifying what is causing this type of behavior, what is causing them wanting to numb like this or just escape like this or self-harm in this way, that's the system. And I, I keep saying the system is broken. And as we know, if we go down that rabbit hole, we have to go down big pharma and insurance. And again, it's enough to make a head swirl, especially in our communities. And we talk about the prison systems. Oh, they're all interconnected and they're all corrupt and they're all broken. I'm sorry. I do center my delusional joy. So I will get out of this hole. <laughs> um, but, and, and again, that's why, you know, I always tell my people, like we have to create our own systems. We have to create our own ways of being. And so I remember I led a workshop for Black men. Actually, when I first got to Cincinnati, and it was very, very, very successful, I was surprised by it, how many men that actually came out that were willing to um, experiment with meditation, right? Because even science and the literature and brain scans show when you can learn how to hit a certain thing in your brain by learning how to control your breathing, it's as if you're smoking weed. It's as if you just hit a crack pipe. It's as if you're having sex, like all these things, the vices that people use. And it was amazing that after this workshop, I had about maybe 20, because I wanted to do a pre and post, say that after a couple of weeks of trying meditation, they decreased in their use of these substances. And they was like, wow, you know, I, I didn't know, or I didn't believe it, or I didn't but I just challenged them. I said, just, just try. I want us to experiment for a couple of weeks, but I need you all to do it in just five minutes. You know, so just incorporating simple things to say, hey, we don't always need to replace this with a drug. And now it's getting popular, like with meditation in, in the hip hop industry. You know, I never forget J. Cole was like, before you roll up, let's breathe. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, yes. Um, and so they're, they're kind of, you know, um, gravitating to it a little more, but yeah, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because it's, it's all very interconnected. Our time is, is actually going by fast, which is crazy. Cause I don't know if these town halls have gone this fast before we get ready to start wrapping and take last statements. I have a particular question for you, Dr. Hall, you know, when we began to have this conversation about this topic and we talked about black men and the challenges they face with mental health. Jado also kind of touched down on this a little bit when he first opened up. Um, one thing that I have heard often from some of the black men in our community. And let's really just be real frank right here. Everybody isn't coming from a college educated background and everybody isn't coming from a, a background where they are privy to having even parents that are pouring into them and giving them that guidance that we need to just be balanced. And so some of our Black men are living a real hood life that we don't really talk about because, you know, we keep that quiet in our community. But those are the ones who need therapy the most. And in my, in my conversations with them, their fear of therapy is the stuff that I need to talk about and heal from is stuff that I can't tell nobody at all from the things that I've done and experienced. But I'm afraid to go to therapy because I know they say it's confidential, but if I go in here and tell you about what I've done on for other people and how I've been let down or what led me to going to jail that I didn't get convicted for, but it still bothers me, I can't go to therapy and be really transparent. They're afraid of that. So can you kind of speak or encourage them in that area? Because I hear that quite often. Yeah. Like women that are in the hood. Yeah, no, I mean, the whole system that is therapy does not work if you can't trust that what you tell me stays in the room. Uh, I can't let you, if you tell me you're going to go out and actively shoot a person, then yeah, I got to do something about that. Or if you tell me you're going to shoot yourself or hurt yourself, I got to do something about that. But if you tell me about crimes you've committed, which I've had clients tell me 
stuff that they've done. And I just, okay, um, that was the past. How do we make sure we're not making those decisions? Uh, particularly when you're talking to Black men around anger, you know, the type of stuff that sometimes they've done to people in their lives and their families where they know there's a lot of shame uh, and often not being able to get out of that cycle of shame, right? They feel ashamed about it. So they feel bad, which makes them angry on the inside because they can't manage that hurt, can't forgive themselves, which makes them more likely to perpetrate again. And so uh, I try to help them manage that uh, as best I can. And I mean, I would just to go back to what uh, Kenya was saying and what Dr. Brooks was saying, everybody copes in one way or another. And a lot of times we've learned what we call maladaptive, not helpful ways to do that. So you've got to sort of adjust your way of thinking so that you can find healthier ways to manage this thing called life because it's stressful on everybody. Uh, and if you don't learn how to do it in a healthy way, you're just going to keep the cycle of unhealthy thoughts and actions that uh, keep you feeling stuck. And so when they're asking these questions or they're saying, hey, I can't go to therapy because I, you know, the things I need to heal from some things that I did in my past, it's okay to tell them that you can go and you can share that and it's confidential. And that is me telling them the truth when we say that, right? Absolutely. That's that's the the, the foundation of, you, if you don't trust that I'm keeping it confidential, you're not going to want to be there. You're not going to want to tell me the real stuff that's going on with you. So you got to be able to trust that. And, um, you know, we end up being the keeper of the secrets. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, I, I really want to tell you guys, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience here with us as we are getting ready to wrap the conversation and turn it over to our fearless leader, Ms. Renee Mahaffey-Harris, the leader and CEO of the Center for Closing the Health Gap. I want to do some closing comments. We'll start with you, Kenya. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing? That mute button. <laughs> um, I, I truly enjoyed this. Um, I was terrified, you know, I was terrified in the beginning, but I have learned so much. Um, and it, this was an amazing experience and I really appreciate being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing your journey with us. Jado. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Chop. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, um, for y'all enlightening on a subject that I feel like a lot of people in our community need to be more knowledgeable about and get rid of the stereotype of therapy. Like, it's not just for people who are crazy. That's a lot of what a lot of people feel. So uh, thank y'all for just enlightening, enlightening this whole thing and just me being a part of it. And I'm just happy to be here, basically. <laughs> but thank y'all. Thank you for your honesty and transparency and all that you do for our community, though. I appreciate you being a voice and saying I'm a black man that went to therapy because, honey, I'm going to give Dr. Hall your phone number. so you can... <laughs> I might Brooks. need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you both their numbers. Dr. <laughs> Closing statements. Uh, I am just grateful and thankful to be able to share space with you all. Thank you all for the vulnerability, the openness. Um, more conversations need to be had that are real authentic and, you know, like I said, lead to um, impactful solutions. So I really appreciate you all inviting me. So thank you. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, Dr. Hall, do you have a closing statement for us? Absolutely. Um, thanks once again for the Center for the Hosing, Closing the Health Gap for having me on the panel today. Um, I'll just remind people to be persistent in seeking the help they need. If you were bleeding out, you wouldn't say, well, that first place I went didn't have Band-Aids, so I'm not going to any other store, okay, right? You. And in that same way, we are often as a community emotionally bleeding out and we need help. And one of the things that we do is we get so discouraged when we go to one place and they're not quite giving us the help we need, or we make that first phone call and they don't call us back. Um, right now, um, Dr. Brooks said it, there is a lot, there are so few of us that look like us and we are overwhelmed by the demand, but if you need the help, the help is out there. So keep pushing to get it. Dr. Hall and Dr. Brooks, thank you guys for stepping up to the charge of helping us in our community with our mental health. Thank you all for joining us tonight on this wonderful conversation on mental health. And I hope that you guys really take your mental health personal and serious and put it top of mind. I am turning it over to Ms. Renee Mahaffey-Harris. Thank you so much for allowing us to have this conversation tonight. Well, first of all, Tropicana, thank you. And I want to thank Dr. Hall, Dr. Brooks, and Kenya, and DJ Doe, J. Doe. <laughs> thank you so much for being open, vulnerable, willing to share, um, because it's these type of conversations that we need to have 
on this issue, but so many issues. And so I am just very grateful that each of you were willing to just really tell your truth. Um, we need to speak truth to each other more and more because it is going to be up to us to figure out how to save us. And so Tropicana, um, all of our participants today, I just want to thank you. And I pray that we continue to work together to save our lives and to get the help that we need and not be afraid to move forward, as Dr. Hall said, if where we go doesn't give us what we want and need, that we are that we can go somewhere else. And I think that's an important piece to always know you're empowered and, and, and you're your own best advocate. So thank you. You all have a blessed day and holiday weekend and stay safe. Thank you. Thank Good you. Evening, guys. you too.